Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you this morning and to get out of my bed at home and to be here with you. You guys were wonderful this past week in, in pitching in when I fell ill. I want to thank especially John Toth. John is not here today. He's working with his blood pressure. But John is such a trooper, he just jumped right in. And so I promise you that I, you will hear that, uh, that sermon in about another year. So, uh, uh, but anyhow, there's a lot of announcements to be made today. I'm going to move through these as quickly as I can because we want to, there's, they're all important, quite honestly. But to our folks at home, if you want to go ahead and prepare your elements now for communion today, we are celebrating communion here in the sanctuary, but we're also selling, uh, celebrating communion at home with all of our folks. We, we have a big thank you for supporting the first Sunday collection for sharing and caring. Also, I'm pleased to announce that $511 was collected during Super Bowl Sunday, and it was donated to sharing and caring. Thank you to everyone who made that announcement, who made that possible, excuse me. We have some uh, other upcoming uh, events. The Willing Wall is something that I've not worked with since I've been here, but I have been told it's a, it's a, it's a mainstay in this congregation. But the Willing Wall is located in the narthex to the right of the front doors. And so there you will find sign-up sheets for fellowship time hosting, for flower calendar, for Presbyterian women birthday luncheon, and for the liturgist. So please look for that, wa not Wailing Wall, the Willing Wall. <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right, set your clocks forward one hour next Saturday night, okay? I expect to see all of you here, and I'll be here too, so... Don't forget about it. Uh, I love daylight, sharing, uh, daylight saving time. Not everybody does, but uh, I am looking forward to it. I really am. Uh, our fourth Bible study session, Extending Peace, is going to be held on Sunday, March the 10th. It's going to be in the library from 11.30 a.m. to 12 noon. Now, MG, I'm going to get right to you here, and why don't you go ahead and come on up now, and then I'm going to have one more thing after you're done, friend. I just wanted to give an update on the refrigerator. I mentioned last week, we did have it installed Tuesday. Uh, they sent the truck, I ordered Monday, they sent a truck to pick it up Monday night and they delivered it Tuesday, so it's there working. Uh, the fellowship committee, the property committee and your church, thank you to those who have donated toward that. Replacing that and those who are going to donate towards it, we give you a great thanks for that. We did the breakfast last week without a refrigerator and we realized how much we really use that thing. So it's, it is, a necessary piece of equipment back there in that kitchen. Uh, the other big surprise you're going to have next week is during the offering, we've all got very comfortable of watching Jackie play, which we all love and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and with the plates being left in the back and not being bugged while we're enjoying Jackie playing, that's going to stop. We're going to start having the offering plates passed again. And it's not just to get money out of you. It's not for that reason. Uh, some of us have blessings during the week we need to be reminded of, and the plate helps us do that. We also want to have the friendship or the uh, visitor cards to start being filled out, and it gets somewhere for that to be placed for the minister to know who's here. Prayer concerns for the minister can be placed in the offering plate. Uh, items for the uh, church administrator to take notice of can be placed in the offering plate. It's just a great means of communication, but it's an important part of our service to give this offering up to God and to share our concerns. So that's going to be starting next week. A little bit different format than we did before, so don't be surprised when it happens next week. It's not going to be a real shocker. Just a different layout of how we're going to proceed through the building. That's all I got. Thank you, MG. There are a couple of things I want to mention here that are not in the announcements here, but I want to mention again that we have our 2024 Lenten devotionals. They are in the narthex. If you would like to pick up one of those, there are plenty of them. There are a few more uh, devotional books called These Days. I think there are three left for the months of March, April, and, or April, May, and June is what they are. And so please get one of those if you would like that. I also want to mention to you that we're in the time of the year where we are going to be taking probably the biggest offering of the Presbyterian Church. 
as a, as a denomination. And it's called One Great Hour of Sharing. Now, what happens is, is they send us these little banks every year. And I'm trying to make some noise here so you can hear it. They send these for children. But quite honestly, what I've done in the past is I have used those for adults too, just to keep us mindful that when we pass this, when it's in our, in our home, if we have loose change in our pocket, put it in there. I will be working with the children when they are back next Sunday. Hopefully they'll be back next Sunday on this, on this bank. But this is a, a one great hour of sharing bank. And what, what I do have here is I have a number of these banks that I will place in the offering plate for you to take as you go out today. But the last thing I want to mention today is today's sanctuary flowers right here. They are given by George Goodall on the occasion of Fran Goodall's birthday, and it is today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Fran. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And if you didn't notice, Fran was singing happy birthday to herself, which I love. I think that is... Pardon, Fran? I'm happy to be here. And I was going to say, next week is Anne's birthday, too. Oh, okay. Anne Cypher. She's sitting right there. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, Anne told me how old she's going to be, but I'm not going to say it, Anne. Okay, don't, you, good. Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Folks have, MG, Jim, have I got it all, guys? We okay back there? Good. I, there's so many announcements. They're all important. We just want to make sure we take time to remember those so that we can be involved in the activi activities of the church. This is a, there's a lot going on in this congregation, folks. There just is. And we're glad that we're able to be together to share in that ministry. And so let us begin our worship today with, with our opening prayer. Oh God, there are many forms of beauty in your world. One is the beauty of all these faces gathered in worship and expectation. Make us aware of the beauty in one another. A beauty from you because you are our Lord. Because you have made us with your features, your own desire to love and be loved. Let this be a time of true fellowship and deep meaning for us as we recognize and celebrate your presence, shining in our hearts, glowing in our faces, a presence that was known so fully in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. As you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship? Come unto God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us sing to the rock of our salvation. Even in the deserts of our lives, God is among us. Come, let us worship and bow down. 
Let, Let us kneel before, before the Lord, Lord our, our Maker. Let, Let us worship God together. does not wait for us to be righteous or pure or perfect. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. We do not have to hide our sin from God, but we can face it with Jesus, who heals us, teaches us, and leads us to a new life. Knowing that, we turn to God for help, trusting God's unending grace as we pray together the prayer of confession printed in our bulletin followed by a time of quiet meditation. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus friend of all, all once, once again, again we have come to you knowing our words have stung, our actions have harmed, and our indifference has let evil have its day. Our hearts yearn for you, our souls thirst for you, yet we do not imitate you in our lives. We scorn those who are different from us and relish our own comfort. Once again, forgive us, O God. Give us your living water that we may tell the world all you have done for us. Amen. Amen. We know that God is with us even in our sufferings, for suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts. Thanks be to God, we are truly forgiven.
Please be seated. We do not have our young disciples with us today, and so we look forward to a time when they will be with us. Let us pray. O Lord of light and salvation, let these words of Scripture live not only in our mouths, but in our hearts, that we will embody your truth and confess with our lives that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. It is located on page 218 of the New Testament, if you would like to follow along. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside of their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture lesson today comes from the book of Psalms. And it is Psalm 8 today. And I'm going to highlight something during the sermon today, but I'm going to mention it to you before I actually read it today. This is Psalm 8. It is on page... Gosh, goodness gracious, it is on page 492 of your Old Testament. Now, I want you to listen to the first of this, okay? Because usually, honestly, I have worked with this psalm before, but I've not included this particular part. So listen as I get going here. Psalm 8. It says underneath it, divine majesty and human dignity. And then it says this, to the leader, to the leader, according to the Giddeth. A Psalm of David. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I'm not going to beat you over the head with this, but I want to mention it again, how important this beginning is in this song. Our pew Bible, what I read to you says, to the leader, to the leader, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. Now, the way this is working here is that these words are instructions to the musicians, the conductor in particular. Psalm 8 is a song to be done to the Giddeth tune. Now, it's obvious I am not a musician, and Jackie reminds me of this on on occasion, but I am not a musician. She is, so I'm not going to try to do her, her stuff here. But I, have, I do have a hunch as to what that tune might have sounded like. Surely it would have been a majestic tune, for the song proclaims the majesty of God. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? I think I can. The cacophony of the symphony warming up begins to die out. People begin to take their seats and the conductor taps the baton and they strike up a note of majestic praise. And the heavenly choir sings, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It is the refrain of the song. And it is also the first and the last line of Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, in the first stanza, the whole heavenly choir sings of the greatness of God, the God who has displayed his splendor above the heavens, the God whose greatness will be proclaimed even by children. It is amazing, isn't it, how little children can make so clear the greatness of God. Let me give you an example here. There is a renowned um, theologian that has been widely read. He died, I believe it was 1971, 72. His name was Karl Barth. And he is a renowned Swiss theologian. And, and when he visited America, he was asked what was the most profound theological truth he knew. This is a giant in terms of theological thought. And here's what he said. He said this. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a children's song, folks. Out of the mouths and babes of babes and infants, our text says, a simple song, yet so full of majesty. But as the but as the song continues, there is a tension in the music. It seems that there are enemies who would overthrow this God. Still, though, the song reminds us that God makes the enemy and the vengeful, vengeful cease. He makes them stop. Then a gorgeous song of praise is played. It tells the glory of God's creation, the heavens being the work of God's fingers. God made the moon and the stars and, oh, the stars. Now, I don't know how many of you are star watchers, but as a little boy, I had an experience that I'll, I'll never forget it. My family, uh, we lived in Houston, and we weren't far from the Gulf Coast. And we would go down to Matagorda Bay every year, and we would spend a week at Matagorda Bay. And, of course, this was in the 60s, and so... We, we could do this at that time, but we would, at night, we would lie out on the, on the boat or on top of our cabin watching the stars, looking at the stars. And together we would find the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, and I think of those nights even now when I see those stars. And when I do think of those stars, I think of God. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. He has us out on a summer evening. We're lying on our backs in the grass, looking at the star, stars while the music plays a tune of God's creation. I hope you can hear it now. That's the first stanza, the greatness of God. Remember the words, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, now then there's a second stanza. That's where the title of this sermon comes in, folks. There is a second stanza. And in the silence, as we contemplate God's greatness, the psalmist throws out an awesome, humbling thought. We can sense it in the music. And the thought is, what are human beings that we are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. In other words, what is being said here is why would the great, majestic, creator God think anything about us? The psalmist here tells us that God not only has thought of us, but has placed us in a position over creation, second only to God. The words of the song and the music together cause us to get lost in the wonder of it all. The God who created everything thinks highly of us. And what a song. I hope you can hear it now. Now, I wonder what led David to write such a piece. I picture him out among the sheep in the Judean countryside. It's a beautiful mid-morning. And as David takes in the beauty of God's creation, he remembers a story. He remembers a story as a young boy a story about creation itself. God creates order out of chaos, heavens and earth out of nothing. God speaking light into existence, speaking plants and animals into existence. And at each stage along the way, God steps back to say, this is good. But it was when God created humanity that God said, this is very good. And suddenly there on that hillside, David has this wonderful thought. The crowning achievement of God's creation is humanity. It was a thought so wonderful that he wrote down this song to the tune of Giddeth to be sung by all Israel in worship. A song also to be sung today. A song about us and the place we hold in the heart of God. It is an incredible song. When God created the sun, 
that flaming ball of fire that warms our world and gives us light, God said, this is good. When God formed the colors of the sunset onto the canvas of the western sky, God marveled again, saying, this is good. And then, listen to this, and then God created you and me, and he said, this is very good. Now, I want you to do something for me if, if you travel by car. Some of us don't travel by car as much as we used to, but some of us still do. But the next time you're on vacation or you're traveling somewhere and pull off the road at one of those scenic views and stand there elbow to elbow with all these people looking at the creation of God, I want you to remember this. The creation of God is looking back at us. The creation of God is looking back at us. What I'm saying here is that God admires us. We are the crowning achievement of God's creation. Now, I suppose this is probably what an author feels when they create a character in a novel. Perhaps that's how Shakespeare felt about Hamlet when he began to come to life on paper. Shakespeare began to realize, he began to realize what a great character was coming into existence. Hamlet is a character that Shakespeare thought up. And the transition here is that we, you and me, you and I, we are characters God thought up. We were created by God. And what's more, we were created for God. Now let me ask you this hypothetical question. What if Hamlet were to change his lines? What would happen if Hamlet changed his lines? What then? Then Hamlet would no longer be Hamlet. He would no longer be what he was intended to be. Folks, we were intended by God to live for God. We are God's intentional creation. And so if we somehow sometimes find ourselves feeling disconnected from God, I want you to hear this story, and I think it's very meaningful. April was a little orphan girl who had been placed in one home after another. She had been so abused, she began to retreat into her own dream world. April's fantasy world was one in which she found great happiness in her songs. She pretended to have a family and friends. And so she would write down the words to her songs and then she would hide them. One day, her foster parents noticed April humming and writing with a special sense of purpose. Only this time, this time she took the notes she had scribbled. She went down the stairs, out the door, and over to her favorite tree. She climbed up the tree and she placed the piece of paper between two crossed branches. Her, her foster father, he got a ladder, he climbed up to the note and he took the note and he read it and he began to cry. He handed it down to his wife saying, you better read this. And it said, whoever finds this, I love you. And through David in Psalm 8, God wrote this song, Whoever finds this, I love you. So here's what we have been waiting to hear. The God who made us loves us. The one who knows us better than anyone loves us anyway. What a song. Whoever finds this, I love you. You hear it now, don't you? I hope you do. Let us pray. Now to the ruler of all worlds, undying, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and forever. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is printed in our worship bulletin. Let us stand now and say what we believe together. The reconciling act of God in Jesus Christ exposes the evil in people as sin in the sight of God. 
In sin, people claim mastery of their own lives, turn against each other, and become exploiters and despoilers of the world. They lose their humanity in futile striving and are left in rebellion, despair, and isolation. But God's love never changes. Against all who oppose the divine will, God expresses love in wrath. In the same sense, God bore judgment and shameful death in Jesus Christ to bring all people to repentance and to new life. Amen. Please be seated. We invite you today to profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> we also invite you to unite in membership with us here at First Presbyterian Church. If you are interested in discipleship or in membership, please see me after worship today. As we give our gifts... Let us realize that we are sharing our gifts with the whole world through the work and the ministry of this church and God's kingdom.
Let us pray. Our lives are filled with your gifts, O God. The gift of life itself, the gift of friends and loved ones, the gift of home and food, the gift of daily work to do. There is nothing we can give you, O God, that compares with what you have already given us in Christ Jesus. But help us to give you the best thing we have, ourselves, and with them to share the good things that you have given for the sake of others. Amen. Please be seated.
now may God who has made all the seasons of the year and the seasons of your, in your life also grant you the serenity and joy in the serenity of your soul and in the world to come to everlasting life. Through Jesus died who died and lives forevermore. Amen. Thank you.